Hey everybody, Teching and Barry back again. And actually, you know what? It has been a while since Barry has been at the forefront of this channel. You know, back in the day we used to talk about Barry all the time. Lately it just seems like he's a background decoration, and that is not how Barry D. Brick should be treated. Yeah, he's always back there, watching us, silently guiding us along the right path, but we actually haven't talked to him in so long. So you know what, Barry? Come on up. Ugh. Come on up, man. How you been? Talk to the people of YouTube. Anything you want. Anything at all. Floor is yours. You know, that's really interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll let you continue. Hmm. Wow. Um, yeah, that's... Uh... Uh, what, what do you guys make of that? Yes or no? Do you agree with Barry? Um, I agree. It's a bit of a contentious issue, but um, for Barry to explain it in such a clear and erudite way, I've never, I've never considered it from that angle before. Huh. Way to go, Barry. That's why you are the right hand. Wait, hold on. Yeah. Right hand of this channel. Yes. Or maybe you're the one that's in charge of everything and I'm the right hand or hell, maybe I'm like way, way further down than I thought. Now it goes, it goes Barry. Then it goes, you know, Barry the bee or whatever. And then we have Perry the plant over here. And there's a bunch of other inanimate objects before it finally gets to me. But I'm involved at some point. At some level, I'm, in, I'm relevant to the Teching 101 YouTube channel, all right? Well, anyway, today's video, we're going to be talking about the supporting characters in the One Piece world, okay? Now, when I say supporting characters, I don't mean, like the really prominent supporting characters. Probably not the supporting characters you think of when you immediately think of One Piece. Today, we're focusing a little bit more on the little guys, all right? So you have characters that are really strong in the story, and there's usually somebody, you know, right next to them. They're second in command. Not necessarily their first mate, because not all of them are pirates that we're going to be talking about today. But uh, somebody that stands next to them, that kind of fills in for anything that they cannot. And i got to be honest with you, I've always really loved that dynamic. Um, let's say you have this really powerful character in an anime or any kind of like fictional medium okay and uh they might be super powerful to the point where they could take out an entire army by themselves like in terms of raw energy and power no one can compare but i also love the level of humility i guess is the term yeah a little bit of humility there where they admit that they have faults still there, there's issues there's things that they um simply don't have the capacity for like for example let's say there's somebody that's really powerful but doesn't really have any ambition or a dream drive. And so they get somebody to help them out that does have ambition and drive, and so forming a combo, like a team, they work together to achieve greater heights. Something along those lines. I really like that, because that, like, lends the idea that, like, hey, I know I'm really powerful, but you know, I'm not a god. I'm not omniscient or anything like that. I do need some people to help me really achieve my dreams, okay? A good example of subverting that, and actually a character that did believe themselves to be a god, would be Eneru. Eneru is an interesting character in his own right. No one would say, well, I mean, I'm sure some people would say that Eneru was an insanely boring character. He's interesting, but part of the reason that did not make him as interesting as I thought he could be was the fact that he was just like, I'm great! I am a god! I do not need anyone around me! He didn't even care about his own priests, really, because he felt like he was just so powerful on his own, right? And so, he's alright, but I like that other dynamic. Like in the case with Bleach, we have Yamamoto and uh, Chojuro, and this was something that was just, you know, brought up in the new anime. Uh, my favorite example of this, though, is in Vinland Saga, where you have Askeladd and Bjorn, all right, in the first arc of Vinland Saga. Askeladd is this insanely powerful soldier, able to cut down, like, dozens of people at a time. Like, he's insanely strong, okay? And you think, at like, man, he doesn't even need anybody around him. He could be you know, out there as a mercenary making his living on his own, honestly, and he would be fine, right? But the fact is, he has a right-hand man, and that is Bjorn, who's this giant hulking Viking that eats mushrooms and, like, roids out, and just, like, rage mode, you know? But their dynamic together, it's just, they're, they're, the duo just works, you know? And it's just like, hey there, Askeladd, I'll take care of this thing for you. Thanks, Bjorn, I can always count on you. It's like that kind of, like, like, a little bit of a bromance kind of thing going on. They're just like, yeah, you know, we're best friends, kind of of a thing. I, I really like that. Uh, and it also just showcases that, like, Askeladd is smart enough to realize that, like, yeah, I'm really powerful, but having somebody to watch my back 
would definitely be nice to have, you know? And so he's not so much like a, a subordinate. There is a chain of command, but it's more of like we're on equal terms, okay? Another way of this is like the second in command, actually like their dream, their ambition, their desire is to help out their number one. So we have Zoro, who's the prime example of this, okay? Zoro is, of course, the vice captain or the first mate of the Straw Hat Pirates right under Luffy. He was the first person recruited to the crew by Luffy. And we've seen this mentioned before with Zoro that he was willing to even put his own dream aside, becoming the greatest swordsman in the world, if it meant Luffy achieves his dream at being king of the pirates, okay? So that's like part of Zoro's drive, even more so than being uh, the great swordsman in the world, is his ultimate dream is to see Luffy through his dream, you know, have Luffy achieve his dream of becoming king of the pirates, okay? So that's what it means to have a great first mate, a great right arm, a number two, whatever you want to call them, okay? Although number two, I mean, that's indicative of something else, but whatever. Anyway, there's a lot of characters in One Piece that fit this profile, okay? We have Zoro. We got Rayleigh, who, of course, was the first mate on Roger's crew. We have King, who was the uh, second in, in command of Kaido in the Beast Pirates. We got Blackbeard and Shiryu. We got Shanks and Ben Beckman. We got Kid and Killer. And uh, Law's got Beppo, I guess. You know, okay, all right. They can't all be super strong. Hey, don't doubt Beppo, all right? So long Beppo could wreck your, your day, okay? Well, anyway, I've made videos about all those characters. In fact, I think I have made videos about every single one of these characters. Zoro, I've made a bunch. Rayleigh, I've made a bunch. King, Shiryu, I have a Shiryu video. I made a video about Ben Beckman not too long ago. Killer, yes. Beppo, yes. Okay, yeah, so I've made videos about all of them. Today we're talking about characters that are in a supporting role, but are not that prominent into the story on their own, okay? This came about because I got a few comments asking me to do a discussion video on Bogard. Bogard, in case you don't know, is the right-hand man to Vice Admiral Monkey D. Garp. Now, Garp doesn't show up that much in the story, so therefore Bogard doesn't really show up that much in the story. But I've always really liked his design. He dresses like Humphrey Bogart from Casablanca. Well, I guess the ending scene of Casablanca when they're at the airport and everything. So he's got the uh, the hat and the suit and, like, the trench coat and everything. He's got the marine jacket. Uh, he is a marine officer. He has a very high rank. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if he was a vice admiral in his own right. Uh, but we just don't know what his official rank is. Now, I consider just doing an entire video on Bogard just by himself. And listen, this is me we're talking about. I could easily have done that. I could have done a 25-30 minute video on Bogard, despite the fact we know, like, nothing about the dude. Um, throw in some tangents, a few Casablanca references. We'll be be good. We could stretch it out to 30 minutes. But I, I thought maybe something that will be a little bit more efficient was to take a bunch of side characters that really haven't been showcased that much, throw them all into one video. Okay, so that's what we're here today to discuss. So let's start off with Bogard. First and foremost, we don't even know if Bogard is his real name. See, the thing is, this guy shows up so few in the story. Uh, the name Bogard actually came from uh, the credits in the anime. So when he first showed up, it was when they actually animated the Diary of Kobe Meppo, one of the very few cover series to actually be animated. Uh, you know, he shows up in the credits as Bogard, but that was something that was an that was in the anime. So technically, his name is anime only. Technically, oh has never given us, like, a title box, you know, introducing him. But considering the fact, like, I'm sure Oda checks the wiki on things. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in One Piece. I'm sure every now and then Oda's just like, what happened with this character? And just like, you know, he's only human, you know? So he might look up the wiki to be like, what happened with this guy? Oh, right, it's that dude. So I'm thinking that if Bogart ever does do a significant thing in the story and he is, like, warranted, like, having a title box, you know, introducing him. Like, this is Rear Admiral Bogart. I'm sure Oda will keep his name, but it's just something important to mention right there. Um, so as I mentioned previously, his name and his dress is similar to Humphrey Bogart, uh, Bogart, because the actual actor's last name is B-O-G-A-R-T. Bogart in One Piece is B-O-G-A-R-D. All right, well, anyway, uh, the design seems to be, like I said, most indicative at the end of Casablanca. If if you've ever seen Casablanca, it's a great flick, one of the best of all times. You should go check it out. Um, and so he's got the hat and everything, and he just is always kind of hanging out next to Garp. Very stoic, very... He doesn't smile very often. He doesn't really express himself. He's just there. He's all business, so to speak. Very much like Rick, who is Humphrey Bogart's character in Casablanca. Neutral on all matters, very stoic, just kind of there. He does have emotion.
emotion, but it's hard to really get it out of him. You know what I mean? So uh, Bogard's first significant thing that he did in the story was during the diary of Kobe Meppo, when Hel Meppo was kidnapped uh, by his father, Morgan. Is it considered kidnapping if it's your parent that actually ki Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be. Yeah, it, it was. It was. It was. It definitely is. It 100% is. <laughs> okay. Anyway, Morgan, you know, captured Hel Meppo, tried to escape, and then Kobe was like, you know, we need to go after him. We need to save him, okay? And Kobe takes out these two pistols and is, like, waving them around frantically, having, like, an anxiety attack. We need to go save my friend! And then <laughs> Bogart just kind of, like, no, none of the Marines are really doing anything. Some of the lower-level Marines are just like, okay, kid, calm down! Calm down, kid! It's like Kobe's, like, just a chore boy at this point, waving some pistols around. Bogart, all business. He just walks forward with his katana, shing, and then just slices each of the pistols apart in like perfectly little symmetrical shapes like you could garnish a charcuterie board or whatever with these pistols afterwards okay like so extraordinarily precise with that katana all right you don't want to mess with bogart all right he like passes by you and just like the like the uh, eido style or whatever just passes by you with his katana click and then your entire body just you know cut up like sashimi all right so after that, though, that uh, that event there kind of impressed Garp. You know, he's just like, ah, Kobe and Helmeppo, you guys got some camaraderie. You care about one another. You got guts. You got that zeal, you know? So Garp took them under his wing to train them to become proper Marines. However, at the very beginning, Kobe and Helmeppo, I mean, they were pretty, uh, pretty scrawny, pretty doughy, pretty string beany. You know, it, it was going to take a while for them just to get to the point where they were actually able to handle Garp's training. You know, it's kind of like with uh, uh, One for All in My Hero Academia. You know, you can't use 100% of One for All right away. You can't handle all of Garp's training at once. Your bodies will explode, all right? So Bogard was sort of the one that just handles this on his own. And I, I like the idea that, like, Garp is like, all right, you two, I'll, I'll take you under my wing. And no communication between Garp and Bogard. It's just Garp just kind of looks over at Bogard, his trusty right-hand man, and he's just like, mm. and then Bogard's like, mm -hmm. and then he, it's like it's understood between the two that like, all right, I'm training you. Come on, here's some practice swords. Let's go. And so Bogard began to like train them in the basics, you know, push-ups, squats, plenty of juice, you know, a 10 kilometer run every single day, like the kind of boot camp stuff. He was basically Kobe and Helmeppo's drill sergeant in the Marines, basically what he was. Okay. So, and, and once they got to a certain level where they've actually trained enough, they got some muscle on them, you know, they could be called like proper Marine recruits at that point. Maybe then then guard started to teach them some stuff individually, maybe more about hockey later on. And obviously, Garp is important guy. He's a vice admiral going off and doing other stuff, so he couldn't always stay and babysit Kobe and Helmeppo. So Bogard was the one that trained them, okay? So the first time he shows up in a more relevant way in the story is when Garp arrived at Eni's, not Eni's lobby, post Eni's lobby back at Water 7, when the Straw Hats were there recovering from their fights with CP9, and then Garp shows up at the Galley La, and Bogard is there as well. He's in the background. You see him right there, okay? So we find out some stuff about Garp and Luffy's past there. The crew finds out that Garp is Luffy's grandfather. We learn about the New World. We get uh, Vegapunk's name dropped for the very first time. We learn about the four emperors we know shanks is one of them we know whitebeard's one of them all that kind of jazz and then right at the end of all this when the marines are about to leave galley la garp is kind of like all right luffy well since i'm your grandpappy i won't turn you into the marines i'll just tell them that it's all good because your family it should be fine and then bogart which is kind of speaks up behind him and it's just like no sir i don't think that'll fly we'll just tell them they got away <laughs> you know do not tell the marines that you just let your grandson go just because he's your grandson he is a pirate he has a bounty of 300 million we'll just tell them they escaped us and they got away we'll just stick with that okay and garp's like yeah all right bogart that's why you're my right hand man all right that's how it goes right absolutely ah uh, can you imagine how garp and bogart first met you know i imagine 
Ah, <sighs> okay, I'm just gonna go ahead with this. This is just my head cannon now. But I'm gonna assume Bogart, he was the owner of a very popular cafe in this uh, kind of like, you know, major town, sort of a waypoint between other locations. And, and he was the, you know, very, uh, very fancily dressed, you know, prim and proper kind of owner of this cafe. And, you know, and he was very involved with the staff and everything like that. And he would always walk around the cafe, make sure everyone's having a good time. You know, if someone's causing some trouble, he would be the one to approach them and everything like that. And, you know, there was some issues with the German, Germa, the Germa caused some trouble in the bar one night. You know, the Germa came in, the Germa double six, and they were causing a ruckus. And then you have uh, Garp showing up and it's Garp and Bogar. That's when they met and they kind of forced back the Germa. And then, um, yeah, it was, I thought that was a friendship that's going to last a lifetime right there. He's just like, I think this was a beginning of a beautiful friendship right then and there. That's how they met each other. Absolutely. Okay. And so it goes back to what I said at the beginning, where your right-hand man basically compensates for stuff that you cannot. Garp is a marine hero. I mean, he's really wicked strong. He doesn't really need any help. But having someone there that takes things a little bit more seriously than Garp does, having someone there that maybe might know how to properly handle a situation in terms of, like, the hierarchy, like the higher-ups, like the admirals and even the fleet admiral, definitely very handy, okay? So Garp Garp just kind of does whatever he wants, and it's essentially Bogart's job to sort of rein him in when he really goes wild. That's Bogart. That's that's pretty much it, right, from him, okay? So I'm hoping he shows up in the future. Uh, yeah, actually, okay. Spoilers for chapter 1071, okay? The, I'll, I'll put it down there in the card or whatever. Spoilers for chapter 1071. If you don't want to hear spoilers, skip to the next section. Skip to the next supporting character we're going to discuss, okay? All right, here we go. All right, so chapter 1071, Garp shows up at the end, right? Garp's there at G14. He's like, come on, Helmeppo. Come on, Hibari. We're going to go knock some heads at Hachinosu. And I was so excited. I was going to make this video before I even knew that happened in the chapter. So I'm like, oh my god, this is so relevant. Bogard is definitely on that ship. He's Garp's right-hand man. He goes wherever Garp goes, okay? Garp is there. Bogard is there. Bogard is going to do some really cool stuff coming up in the arc. I guarantee it. He's going to have some speaking lines. He's going to talk to Helmeppo. Um, if they're going to Hachinosu to directly confront Blackbeard and his entire crew, the 10 Titan Titanic captains and all that kind of jazz, right? We're going to need some really strong Marines. We got Garp, and we got Bogart, and we got Helmeppo, okay? Helme okay, Helmeppo can fight. Helmeppo can definitely fight. He's a lieutenant commander in the Marines, okay? He can definitely fight, all right? Um, then we have Hibari, who is a commander, who I believe is, like, one rank higher than Helmeppo. So Hibari, Hibari might be able to do some really cool shit. She might be, like, freaking Kobeni in Chainsaw Man, where at first, when Kobeni first shows up, it's just like, oh my god, she's whining, she's annoying, she's not really that powerful. And then in the next arc, she's, like, you know, wicked badass. Might be something like that with Hibari, you don't know, okay? But Bogard's got to be there too, all right? So that just gives them more power. So the sad thing is, because Bogard hasn't shown up that much, he might die in the next arc. I mean, I could see him, like, clashing with Shiryu, and for a moment, it's like Bogard gets to flex his skills in hockey and being trained by Garp and the right-hand man of Garp, and then it's like, wow, you're really strong, and then Shiryu does some kind of dirty trick, turns invisible, and, like, stabs him in the back, and that's how Bogard dies. So, I'm hoping that doesn't happen, but I could see it, so I'm glad I'm making the video now about him. All right. Okay, spoilers over. All right, we good? Okay, moving on to the next individual. We have Geen, the man demon, the right hand man to the pirate commodore, Don Krieg. Okay, how dare you, Krieg? All right, so Geen is really cool. Geen is definitely a fan favorite, even though he was an antagonist. I think just because of how sympathetic the dude is, and also the fact that his epithet is the man demon, but he's actually way more, like, he has way more emotion and empathy than you would assume for a guy that has the man demon epithet and Don Krieg is the one that's really the most horrible individual ever that just like never repents for all the horrible things that he's done okay so Gein of, co of course first shows up he was the prisoner being held by full body and his crew he shows up at the Baratier he's starving to death he's like please food somebody anybody and everybody in the Baratier is like no we're not giving food to you you don't have any money also you're the right hand
right-hand man of Don Krieg. Uh, if we give you food, you're just going to go back and let Krieg know we're here, and that's not going to be good for anybody. Now, Sanji, of course, being Sanji and knowing full well what it's like to starve to death, or very close to starving to death, uh, and how terrible that can be, he makes some fried rice for... Um, uh, for Gein. A recipe that I actually believe is in the Sanji cookbook. I have it. I just haven't gotten around to cooking anything in it yet, but I, I believe that recipe is in there. So he makes him some fried rice, and he's eating it, and Gein, you know, you see the tears flowing down his face. It's like, oh my god, this is the greatest thing. Like, like the food is good, and he's not gonna die of starvation, but also, it's just like, this is the nicest thing anyone's ever done to me. And then, he does go back to the Krieg pirates, and he does tell Don Krieg about the Baratier, and they do arrive, but Gein feels super are conflicted about that. He's just like, was this really the right call? I mean, I know I'm a pirate and all, and I work for Don Krieg. I'm the he, his official rank is the combat commander of the Krieg pirates. He is the first mate, and uh, he has the highest bounty, you know, right under Krieg. Uh, I think Krieg had a bounty of 17 million, and then Gein had a bounty of like 12 million, something like that, which by East Blue standards is fairly high. Okay, uh, keeping in mind the absolute highest was Arlong at 20, where uh, Don Krieg was at 17. So Don Krieg was probably like the second most powerful pirate in all of the East Blue, and then Gein was his lieutenant, was his, his vice captain, okay? So, uh, Gein throughout most of that arc is kind of wavering back and forth between, like, do I stand with my captain, or do I stand with, you know, the people of the Baratier and Sanji? And the thing is, Krieg, we learned, like, Krieg really was scummy. Like, he was a horrible person. Krieg did the kind of shit where he would wave the white flag over his vessel and then approach an island. Like, we surrender, and then he would just, like, ransack and burn the whole place down and, like, murder everyone. Like, that's the kind of shit Krieg would pull where you know even in the pirate world there are standards remember like what big mom said to page one like even pirates have a code of conduct whitebeard said the same thing oh if whitebeard ever got a hand on uh don krieg if whitebeard ever decided to make a vacation trip to the east blue and found out the kind of shit that krieg was pulling oh my god they would all be annihilated right whitebeard does not <laughs> it's just like you don't deserve to call yourself a pirate you give pirates a bad name you know that kind of stuff so Gein, though like krieg didn't care he did whatever Ever and uh, exploited whoever he had to to uh, you know further his own power. Gein though off to the side was kind of like, man, this this isn't cool. Like even as pirates, this is messed up. You know, you don't do certain things, right? Especially since Krieg was saved by Sanji too. They gave him food and he was saved from starvation as well. Except Krieg immediately turns around and starts blasting everybody in the Baratier. And so Gein is just like, oh my god, like these people helped us. They were kind to us. And, and Krieg is just like, yeah, they're a bunch of idiots. Shouldn't have helped us to begin with. All you can count on in this world is yourself, Gein. And later on, that was also confirmed Krieg does not care about his own crew. Doesn't even really care about Gein. He cares about Gein because Gein's strong. That's all he cares about, right? And so, but he's not against firing off the gas weapon or whatever. And so, Gein is there. He ends up getting poisoned. Luffy ends up pounding Krieg into the ground like a tent pole. So, that's good. But at the end of the arc, it's kind of like... Gein going over apologizing to everything that, that Krieg did. Like, I'm sorry that he did all this. Um, I'm sorry that I follow him. But at the end of the day, Gein did not... Gein did not completely switch sides. It's important to know that. Gein did not decide that, like, eh, screw the Krieg pirates, screw Don Krieg, just let them all die. I'm with you now, Sanji. Oda could have really done that. Oda could have had a thing where all of the Krieg pirates get wiped out, and then Gein goes and joins the Baratier and becomes a cook. That would have actually worked really well, but no, they worked the thing in with, oh no, he's gotten poisoned, and even after being poisoned with the gas weapon, he still takes Don Krieg and all of his men... And they leave together because it's sort of like Gein is, is making his own bed with this. He's like, listen, um, I'm a horrible person. Like, you know, Gein has definitely murdered a lot of people. You don't get the epithet, the man demon, without committing some, you know. And he was really skilled with those tonfa things, with the iron balls and shit. He's like, yeah, he's like, look, I've committed some horrible atrocities. Um, you know, I'm not just going to, like... I'm, I'm, I'm not just going to, like, bow my head and say I'm forgiven for all that kind of stuff. Um, this is my crew. I'm with him. That's how it goes. And so we're going to be heading out. He promises Sanji he'll meet him again someday. Uh, but he's also poisoned by the gas. And so it's just like, how's this going to go? Is Gein still alive? And this happened 
over 20 years ago in the manga. This happened all the way back in the East Blue. And we haven't seen Gein yet, so maybe he'll pop in again. I think it's One Piece. I don't think, with the way that Oda never really kills that many characters, uh, I, unless it's a flashback, I don't think that Gein is dead. I think Gein is alive. Um, a cure or something was, was discovered, uh, and he's going to be popping back in at some point. So um, that's also, I think, an important thing to mention Gein right about now, okay? So just pay attention. Gein might be making his comeback soon and might get that reunion between him and Sanji. Who knows? Uh, next up, we're going to be talking about this guy right here. Not Ace. We're talking about this man with the blue hair. This is Mast Deuce, who probably has the most overt name for being a number two or a right-hand man, where Ace's name, Ace, number one, and Deuce, number two. There you go. So as you can see, he is a character from the Ace Light Novel series. However, he was confirmed to be canon in the anime. We actually see him during the uh, flashback with Ace and the Spade Pirates when they went to Onigashima. Here he is right here in the anime. There's Mass Deuce, okay? So at least in the anime continuity, he's canon, all right? Uh, I can't imagine they wouldn't. he wouldn't be canon in the manga either. Uh, we have no idea where he's at right now, but whatever. Uh, I did a whole video on the first volume of the Ace Light Novel. I, I think the second one as well. Did I do a video on the second one? I don't remember. I'd have to go back and check on that. I forget a lot of things. Anyway, uh, the basic idea is that uh, Mass Deuce uh, was going to be a doctor. He was in school to be a doctor, but he basically dropped out and went to go be a novelist. And his parents basically disowned him, and he went traveling the world as an adventurer and a novelist. He did not want to be a pirate initially. He didn't want to be a pirate or a marine or a revolutionary. He didn't want to be involved in any of those sort of factions. However, this is the One Piece world, so it's sort of like a law of nature where when you decide to set out to sea, it doesn't matter if you don't want to be involved in any of these factions. If you want to be neutral, you're going to end up in one of these factions sooner or later. Same thing happened with Pedro. Pedro went out to sea to just be an expeditionary party. He wasn't looking to be a criminal. The government made him a criminal, and he became uh, the captain of the Knox Pirates. Same kind of thing with Mass Deuce, where he went out to sea to become just an adventurer and a chronicler and just writing down, you know, the, the next great adventure novel, like Bragman or something like that. And just through half Happen chance, he ended up becoming allies with Ace, which eventually, of course, makes him a pirate. Even if he himself doesn't want to declare himself a pirate, he's a pirate. It's just how it goes, right? So um, they both find each other on a deserted island called Sixus in the east. It's also the place where uh, Ace finds the Mara Mara no Mi. They actually both eat the Mara Mara, but Ace is the first one to bite it, so he's the one that got the power, and um, Deuce, you know, did not receive any ability. He just ate a disgusting fruit. Might seem like a crap deal, but it's symbolic. It's symbolic of how they were starving on this island. They both found a devil fruit and they both ate it. And that's sort of like the Mara Mara no Mi is not just Ace's power. It also represents the bond between him and Deuce, okay? So they go on a bunch of different adventures. They meet Isuka here, who's a marine ensign, who's basically like, uh, you know, how Smoker and Luffy have the rivalry and Garp and Roger had the rivalry. Yeah, in the case with Ace, it was Isuka. And so, yeah, they go on a bunch of different adventures. They go to Sabotori Archipelago. They get a Fishman Island. They go to the New World. They meet Whitebeard. You know, they go to Onigashima, all that kind of jazz. That's Mass Deuce. If you want more information, go read the novel. But I've always really liked his character, and I really genuinely hope he does show up later in in the story in some way. Like, I, I really do, okay? He also serves as, like, the person that reigns in Ace because Ace is the one, of course, that's just, like, running off and just like, oh, wait, I forgot my wallet! And then that's when Mastu shows up and just like, I have your wallet, here you go. Because that's something Ace always forgets to do. He always forgets to bring f uh, money to pay for food or whatever, and he's always, he has the touch of the narcolepsy, so Ace is always falling asleep. Deuce is the one there that's just like, yeah, sorry, everybody, okay, come on, Captain. <laughs> right, so, it is, uh, yeah, it's sort of a, sort of a dynamic there I really enjoy between Ace and Deuce and I'm really hoping that um, he shows up again because he's still alive. Technically speaking, he was part of the Whitebeard crew when the Spade Pirates assimilated with them and then Ace died and then the Whitebeard crew disbanded. So I could honestly see Deuce hanging up the pirate life for good. Like Ace died, Whitebeard died and he's like, this is, I didn't want to be a pirate to begin with. So he might have just retired and might have went off somewhere to just write a book. You know what I mean? Like I don't want to be a pirate anymore. I don't want to be involved. But he would still have a 
bounty. He would still be known as the vice captain of the Spade crew, and he was, I guess, on the Whitebeard crew at one point. So he would still be looked after. People would still be looking for him and everything like that, the Marines and the Cypher Pole or whatever. So he might have to lay low for a little bit, but who knows? Uh, by the way, we don't know his real name. We just don't. He never gave his real name. That that, that name, Mass Deuce, was a name that Ace gave him because he thought it sounded cool, pretty much. That was it. Um, okay, so that's Mass Deuce. Uh, moving on now, we're going to talk about Aladdin. So Aladdin is really cool. Aladdin is a merman that was on the Sun Pirates, and he really climbed through the ranks, okay? So, way back in the day, he was the doctor of the crew when Fisher Tiger was the captain of the original Sun Pirates, okay? Where you had Fisher Tiger, and then you had Jean Bay as, I don't think it was ever directly stated that Jean Bay was the first mate of the Sun Pirates, but Jean Bay was the first mate of the Sun Pirates. He was the right-hand man to Fisher Tiger. Fisher Tiger, the whole incident happens with him at uh, Fool Shout Island, and he's losing blood. Aladdin did everything he could to try to save him. They had the blood on hand, and, you know, Fisher Tiger just refused the transfusion because it was human blood. All right, so Aladdin, even though he had the capability of saving his captain, he respected his wishes and just like, no, I can't allow their blood to be inside of me. I just can't. And so Aladdin was like, you know what? It's the captain's orders. I'm going to just... And, and he's tearing up. He doesn't want to do it, but, you know, he's a merman... And he understands the whole plight. Okay, he gets it. So, Jean Bay becomes the next captain of the Sun Pirates, and Aladdin becomes his right-hand man, all right? And then, most recently, in the Totland arc, uh, Jean Bay decides to leave and become a member of the Straw Hat Pirates, become the helmsman, and so Aladdin becomes the new captain and current captain of the Pirates of the Sun, all right? With his new wife, Praline, who is a member of the Charlotte family, okay? And they seem to love each other very much. See, that was really honestly one of Big Mom's downfalls. It was the fact that Big Mom always, like, never really cared about her children all too much or only cared about what her children could provide for her in terms of strength and, like, Pudding's third eye or anything. So the, the interesting thing is that actually led to her downfall where Praline actually turned on her own mother and uh, double-crossed her and everything and so allowed the Straw Hats to, you know, get away and working along with with the Sun Pirates. Uh, same thing with uh, Chiffon, you know, basically defecting and joining up with Beiji and everything like that. So they're running off with people that they actually love and they ac and actually care for them. Chiffon and Beiji and Praline and Aladdin. Meanwhile, Big Mom is just in the hole. You know what I mean? So there you go. Um, Aladdin, uh, he is a doctor, as I said. He fights with, like, a cool little trident thing. Uh, he most likely knows hockey. We just don't know that much about him really beyond that. Uh, his name is obviously taken taken from, well, I guess it was uh, Arabian Nights is where the name Aladdin originated from, and then the Disney movie, which is Aladdin, which I've never seen, by the way. I've, I've not seen a lot of Disney movies. Ha tell you what, summarize the movie Aladdin to me, the Disney film, as inaccurately and within two sentences as you can. Just the best, worst recap of the movie Aladdin. <laughs> Just go ahead. This should be fun. All right. Anyway, uh, I've seen some clips with the genie, and, you know, Robin Williams is great and everything like that. I've, I've just never seen the film. So Aladdin is pretty cool. He worked his way up the ranks, okay? He was, like, number three, and then he became the number two to Jinbe, and then he achieved the highest status, which when the number two becomes the number one. You know what I mean? So there you go. And I hope he does show up again in this final war or whatever. The Sun Pirates show up. Wadatsume's there. Praline's there. Aladdin's there. They're all there to help help out uh, Luffy and everybody in Jinbei for one last battle. That'll be really cool to see. So that's Aladdin. And then finally, I wanted to bring up a personal favorite of mine, uh, Inazuma, who is the second in command of the Grand Line branch of the Revolutionary Army under Emporio Ivanka. Uh, he is actually the one that saves Luffy and Boncle from level five and the wolves and the cold. Okay, so I, I got to explain something here, okay? So, when I first started reading One Piece Weekly was during the Impel Down arc, and it was right before, um, it, it went, went, actually, I, I remember the exact chapter. It was the chapter where Bong Clay fought against Minotauros. When Minotauros first appeared on level 3, and Luffy used Bazooka, and then Bong Clay was attacking him, and then they go down to level 4 and then level 5. That was when I first started reading One Piece. That was the first chapter I started reading weekly and just picking it up from there, okay? So it wasn't long after I started reading One Piece that Inazuma 
Kurama shows up. And I loved his design. I loved the dual colors. Uh, in the manga, it was black and white. In the anime, it was real to ve revealed to be orange and white. Um, and so, I, even so, though, I really loved the design of that character. I love the awesome lightning bolt scar. Inazuma just means lightning bolt in Japanese, so that's the name. Uh, he's a revolutionary from the South. We don't really know much about him other than the fact that he's the second in command under Ivankov, and he's got the Choki Choki no Mi, which is the scissor scissor fruit, which allows him to, or the snip snip fruit, which allows him to like bend various uh, material as if it was paper. So he can cut a stone floor and just, you know, move it around like it was paper and rearrange it and everything like that. He can lock pick with his scissors. I made a whole video about the Choki Choki no Mi if you want to check that out. Uh, but I just love, I love his design, the flair, you know what I mean? So here's Bong Clay and Luffy in the depths of level 5. Luffy is poisoned within an inch of his life by Magellan. He can barely see or hear or move. He's like, <laughs> you know, he's passing out. And then Bong Clay's there wearing nothing pretty much, just a bare chested in like negative 30 degree temperatures. He's fighting back the wolves and they're right about to die. Like they collapse there on the ground. Luffy does one burst of conquerors, but that's all he can manage. And then he passes out. And it's like, oh no, this is the end of Luffy and Bong Clay's adventure. What's going to happen? And then at the end of the chapter, you just have Inazuma that's just like, ha! Huh! And he just, he just shows up with the pose. He shows up with the flair. I love this. Awesome jacket, awesome hair, awesome shades, holding a wine glass. He holds, you know how badass a character is where even in the middle of pitch combat, Inazuma could be in a fight with a Yonko. He would still have that wine glass there like, hmm, this is a very difficult fight. Ah, the Chardonnay is delicious. You know, he's like, and he uses his devil fruit even with him holding the, the wine glass. Like, it's, it's not like his one hand is encumbered, like he cannot use it. He just incorporates it into the devil fruit. He'll still be holding the wine glass with the freaking pair of scissors or whatever. Okay, so Inazuma... I've just always really liked in terms of just a design. And once again, kind of going along with Bogart, very stoic, very quiet individual that is just like, my job is here to assist Ivankov and help out the revolution as much as I can with flair and style. Hmm. You know what I mean? Strike a pose. Okay, that's Inazuma. Love his character, all right? For more information, go watch the uh, video I made on the Choki Choki Nomi. All right, so anyway, those are just five characters I wanted to bring up today that have that zeal, that have that pizzazz, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Now, moving on to some Porygon facts to end us out. Oh, yes. Wish I had a wine glass. Ah, I should have had a wine glass right here. Actually, you know what? Hold on. I'll go get one. I'll be right back. Okay, so not a conventional wine glass, but... Uh, Cheers. Ah, okay, Porygon facts, go. Okay, so for this one, I just felt we should dive into some of the Pokedex lore for Porygon, right? We have Porygon right here. Because uh, we all know the Pokedex is extraordinarily accurate and not contradictory at all. So uh, I mentioned earlier that the red and blue and yellow uh, descriptions, or rather the red and blue descriptions of him in the Pokedex, just simply say he's a Pokemon that consists entirely of programming code capable of moving freely in cyberspace. In Pokemon Yellow, though, Porygon gets a new uh, Pokedex entry. The only Pokemon anticipated to fly into space. None have managed that feat, however. There are a lot of subsequent Pokedex entries that state that Porygon is able to fly in space, okay? And uh, it's never been shown in the story. He doesn't have an ability that allows him to go to space or anything like that. Um, but you can imagine. I mean, he doesn't require oxygen or food or, you know, uh, water or anything like that or sleep. So Porygon could be used as, like, a deep space probe or something, like the Voyager spacecraft. Just instead of figuring out, um, you know, high-tech camera imaging technology, just take a Porygon and yeet it into space. There you go. Done. Uh, let's see. What else do we have here? Gold and silver. Uh, it is a man-made Pokemon. Since it doesn't breathe, people are eager to try it in any environment. Okay, so that's not even space. This thing's like a tardigrade, okay? It's like we're going to pelt this Porygon with ice and heat and magma and radiation, and we're going to throw it into a vacuum, and we're just going to do everything we possibly can to it, and it'll take it all. All right? 
Uh, let's see here. A man-made Pokemon that came about as a result of research. It is programmed with only basic motions. So it can only make uh, basic motions. This is the original Porygon, by the way, not Porygon 2 or Porygon Z. Uh, Crystal has it as an artificial Pokemon created due to extensive research. It can perform only what is in, in its program. Okay, so wait, can you... Like, like honestly, the capabilities of Porygon, he should honestly be like Mew. You know how Mew is a Pokemon that can learn any TM in the entire games, right? And like any move because it's Mew. Honestly, Porygon should be the one like that. Porygon is a programmed cyberspace Pokemon. It's code. You just be like, it can learn Hyper Beam. It can learn, you know, Phantom Force. It can learn all of this. Porygon honestly should be able to break the, um, the four move limit. Porygon should be the strongest Pokemon ever. Porygon should be stronger than God. Arceus. God. A oh, god <laughs> You know? So there you go. Exactly. 100%. Later, everyone.